Hi, everybody. I think I am live. Ah, uh, yeah. So today I am so excited to be here and talk to you about ambient and particularly how we have been as a community making ambient so much simpler since the initial launch of ambient, which I believe was uh, September 7th, uh, we just had MBM first birthday recently. So uh, very nice to meet you all here virtually. I wish it could be in person, but uh, let's go. Um, so for folks who don't know me, uh, my name is Lin Sao. I've been a very long time contributor to the Istio project since the very first day. Uh, I joined Solo about two years ago. Right now I'm the head of the open source uh, at Solo, uh, working primarily on uh, our open source contribution, which the biggest contribution is the Istio project. So I've made a lot of contribution to the Istio project. I'm one of the founding uh, TOC and steering committee member. Uh, I'm so fortunate still serving on the Istio TOC and steering at the moment. I wrote two books about Istio. My recent book is with Christian Posta about Istio Ambient Explained. So if you're interested in Istio at Ambient at very high level about um, how to get started what are the business uh, value we're providing? Do check out that book. A little bit fun fact about me is uh, I actually worked at IBM for a very, very long time, uh, almost close to 20 years uh, before I joined Solo. So uh, at my last day where I was at IBM, I was, of course, super sad to leave in such a wonderful workplace. And a little fun fact about me is I do a lot of patenting and inventing while I was at IBM. So I went to the corporate directory, uh, which we call it uh, Blue Page um, back then at one point. Uh, and then I took a screenshot of how many patents I contribute to IBM. Uh, so that was 207. So that means I contribute that many numbers of patents to IBM Corporation uh, with me as the co-inventor. So a uh, fantastic experience about writing these patent disclosures. Um, so that's a little bit fun fact about me. Now I want to shift your attention to talk about ambient. So I mentioned September 7 last year, uh, we launched Ambient as uh, an Istio community. It was an extremely special day for us. Uh, we were able to introduce a new data play mode for Istio without Saika. So uh, we uh, wrote a great blog, uh, which a few of us are the co-author of the blog to introduce uh, to everybody why we introduce uh, Ambient. What problem are we solving? Um, and what's the new architecture, um, particularly with the layering of architecture of Ambient? So if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you uh, after the session, check out this uh, blog out there. So I want to spend a minute to talk about um, challenges with sidecars. Many of you actually already know. So raise your hand if you feel like you already know all the challenges of the sidecars uh, in the chat. I'd love to see that, see if you agree with me. So the first uh, is the operation challenge, right? You have to uh, inject that sidecar, right? When you first deploy your application, you're probably using Kubernetes. You don't have that sidecar, right? So you have to inject that sidecar. And then what we see in the community is you may also already have a sidecar container that's not on way proxy. You may also have an init container for your application pod. And we start to see there are sequence issues uh, and most, most likely lifecycle management issues between your own init container, your own sidecar uh, container that's different than what Istio inject for you with the Istio init and the Istio sidecar proxy that may causing you some problems. And also as your application coming up and down, uh, there may be life cycle sequence issue between the Istio proxy uh, with your application pod. Uh, this is why uh, 
exists a whole, uh, there is a parameter and annotation card hold application until proxy is ready. I remember I was driving um, for that in the Istio community because a lot of our user was asking for it. Um, and then the other thing is there's a lot of CVE comes with Envoy proxy, right? So we tend to release a lot of uh, CVE um, and ask you to restart your application to pick up the newer version of Istio proxy. Um, we don't support Kubernetes jobs. Um, we don't support our server send first protocols. So these are the different challenges related to transparency of the cycle. And the other thing is incremental adoption, right? Most of our users are actually using uh, Istio because they love mutual TLS, right? They want to use Istio to secure their communication between their applications. They want to rely on Istio to manage the uh, the certificates uh, for their application parts. Um, in these simple scenarios, when you just need Istio for mutual TLS, unfortunately, you still have to run Istio proxy the entire sidecar, right? Because we don't have a simple version of the sidecar to allow you just using uh, the layer four function, uh, particularly the mutual TLS function of the sidecar. Um, the third challenge with Saika, I would say, is uh, the resources challenges. Uh, and we try to mediate uh, that challenging with the introduction of Saika resources. You guys probably all see Carl Stoney's tweet about when we first introduced Saika resourcing Istio, how it was helping uh, his company to dramatically reduce uh, CPU and RAM, right? For, uh, for the proxy and for SCOD. Uh, we've also seen a lot of our users complaining about SCO proxy uh, sidecar resources uh, requirements was overly excessive. We've seen uh, people complaining about remove their default resource limits for the sidecar. So these are the different challenges with sidecar um, that some of you, I know most of you are perfectly happy with the sidecar, but some of you may you know, hold back of adopting Istio uh, because of the sidecar challenges we have. And that's exactly why we introduced uh, Istio Ambient Service Mesh. Um, so in a nutshell, what is Ambient Service Mesh? Uh, it's the new sidecarless data play mode that we introduced in Istio. And what's really cool about Istio Ambient is we're slicing the architecture into two layers, uh, the layer four layer that focus on providing a zero trust security tunnel for you. And then there's the layer seven layer. If you do need a layer seven uh, functionality from our service mesh, then you can optionally deploy the waypoint proxy. Um, and the, what's even exciting since the initial launch is uh, it's your ambient service mesh uh, started as an experimental branch and was was merged uh, in master in Istio 1.18 and uh, remain alpha in 1.19. And we're, we're working really, really hard to drive to the next phase, which is beta. Um, I can't tell you which release is going to be. Uh, if you want to find out more details, I'd encourage you to join the ambient uh, developer meeting because everything uh, is changing rapidly uh, with a lot of contributors uh, collaborating on ambient. Um, and then let me uh, quickly summarize the key benefits of Ambient, right? The first benefit, which I think it's the most important benefit is simplify operations, right? Ambient enables us to uh, not needing to restart your application uh, part as you enroll uh, into uh, Ambient, right? As you, uh, you don't need to restart also for picking up a CVE from either uh, layer four or layer seven from ambient service mesh. So that's super cool. Um, the other thing is uh, ambient is also designed to save cost for you, right? We talk about excessive 
supervision resources of the sidecar proxy, right? So that's what Ambient is designed for. And we have some preliminary numbers, which I will share in a little bit about that. And last but not least, the Ambient is designed to improve performance for you, particularly in the cases if you are only needing Ambient for layer seven, um, the zero trust tunnel, uh, primarily for mutual TLS and simple authorization policies. Um, you guys are probably all familiar with uh, this diagram. And so uh, essentially there are, a Z tunnel is deployed as a daemon sets onto every single node of your Kubernetes cluster, and it manages the paths enrolled into ambient um, and it can manage multiple of them, which is super cool. Uh, so MBMH provide a shared per node Z tunnel to provide that zero trust tunnel. Um, if essentially Z tunnel can assume the identity of the pods currently running on the same no node. And one thing I want to point out, this is not super obvious to everybody is if you do have layer four policy, um, on your pods uh, that you want to enforce, even if your client uh, is in the same uh, node, the co-located Z tunnel will continue to enforce the layer four policy for you. So in this example, uh, C3 on the right side uh, is the client. And if it's trying to reach out uh, the server one or two, even though they are co-located, um, the authorization policy for layer four will continue to be enforced uh, for co-located pods. Uh, just a little bit of dive a little bit deeper into Z tunnel architecture. By the way, this is a, a picture from the blog uh, John and I wrote about Z tunnel. So do check that out if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Z tunnel. So when Z tunnel comes up, uh, Z tunnel is uh, serving as an XDS client. It's also serving as a CA client. In this case, uh, Z tunnel uh, as an XDS client would establish secure connection to ISOD on 15012 and ask, hey, can I get my XDS configuration? And ISOD will recognize, oh, you are a Z tunnel instead of a, a sidecar or instead of a waypoint proxy. And this is your um, XDS configuration. And then and then Z tunnel is going to act as a CA client and ask, hey, can you give me certs for this particular application A or application X that I'm, I'm managing on co-located on my node? And then um, ISTUD is going to check, oh, are you really allowed to represent this particular application? Is this application A has pod uh, that's co-located on your particular Zetano's node? It is, if it's so, then let me, hand you off, you know, send you the certs and means the certs for you. So that's uh, essentially how the Z tunnel architecture works. So uh, when we first uh, designed Z tunnel, we actually studied Z tunnel with the pre-programmed uh, Envoy proxy. And uh, it was an idea. I remember back then uh, about a year ago, there was like three person on the team uh, in the community can kind of debugging the Z tunnel configuration when Zetano was written in Envoy proxy. It was uh, super complicated uh, with, uh, with Zetano handling um, configuration for multiple co-located application pods. So we started thinking about, you know, how do we simplify uh, the situation, right? So SUD generates Envoy configuration and sending this huge XDS configuration. Only three people in the community can understand and, um, and Envoy execute the configuration. So uh, if you guys don't know, Envoy is not uh, meant for human. It's really meant for machine. Uh, this is a famous quote uh, from Yuva, uh, one of my favorite co-workers. Um, and 
also from Rob Salmon. Hey, he gave a wonderful presentation in two years ago now. Uh, talk about you know what Envoy heals, uh, you know all these wonderful configurations of Envoy. Um, the truth is, uh, the Z Tunnel Envoy configuration back then when it was initially launched, it's way more complicated than any of the Envoy configurations in Sidecar because of the fact that it needs to have configuration for all the co-located pods. Um, so that made the team, the community start to, you know, back to the drawing board about, you know, is Envoy the right configuration for Zeta? No, you know, what if we just send the necessary, the absolutely necessary configuration to the Zeta? No, without, you know, render it in the exact format that Envoy needs. That would allow us to save um, a lot of money, right? Because a lot of our users pay uh, the network cost between the data plane to the control plane and also potentially um, save memory and CPU um, by sending way less uh, data down. So uh, we start to think about uh, as a community, what is absolutely necessary for the zero trust tunnel, right? So definitely it needs the co-located workload uh, information, right? The name, the pods, uh, the namespace, the service account, uh, does it support Edge Ball? You know, what's the status? What IP does it have? Or does it even have a waypoint proxy? Because Zetano needs to think out where is the next hop it's sending. So it's important to know whether it has the waypoint proxy. Also, does it have any layer for policies for the workloads? And, uh, you know, what are the services uh, they belong to? So these are the it's uh, absolute necessary information for Zetano. And uh, that's actually not true. <laughs> well, Zetano needs to know not only the co-located um, workload, it actually needs to have visibility into all the workloads, uh, regardless whether they are part of Ambient or not. This is because um, a client uh, here, C1 or C2, could potentially send in requests to any workloads, right? Whether they are inside of the the Istio or whether they are inside of Ambient, uh, that's uh, completely reasonable allowed. Um, all right, so, um, so we st start to think about, you know, what configuration Zetano really needs, right? And that narrows down to the configuration protocol between Zetano and the control plane, SGOD. And this is an example, a rather simplified example of what the workload configuration looks like uh, based on what Zetano really needs and minimum needs. And uh, uh, the protocol indicates uh, whether it's TCP or Edge Ball. So the moment you add your workload uh, through uh, label namespace, the Istio IO data plane ambient, uh, we are going to, the control plane is going to flip uh, the protocol into Edge Ball and send the updated configuration to uh, Zitano. And uh, in, if you have any policy, particularly layer for policy, uh, apply to your workload, uh, SCOD is going to associate uh, your policy uh, with that particular workload and also send the updated configuration uh, down to Zitano. So with that, this is uh, re, uh, results much simplified uh, workload XDS configuration. That's so much simple to read and debug. If you agree, uh, raise your hand in the chat somehow. Let me know. You know the workload configuration compared with the Envoy configuration you had to read in the past. It's like 100x simplified in my opinion, and it's so much less resource from SCOD to generate the XDS. Uh, configuration uh, for Z-Tunnel and reduce the network cost, right? Because some of you might pay for that uh, between Z-Tunnel and SGOD. All right, um, so the next question we start to ask in the community is, uh, what about Z-Tunnel 
implementation now that we have a configuration protocol defined, right? So uh, I believe John did a lot of work on this. Uh, he had a prototype of uh, Z-Tunnel written in Golan, and he also did the initial prototype of Z-Tunnel written in Rust. And as a community, we finally decided on Rust due to its high performance, low resource utilization, and a very battle-tested library, and it can support work saving. In fact, John actually did a, a, a test, a scale test recently where he set up ambient on um, very large scale, hypothetically in a sense, um, but uh, with that uh, large scale on that particular node, uh, Z-Tunnel coming with just 500 megabyte of RAM. So it's unbelievable. Um, so hopefully you see, uh, at this point, you see how we really simplify Z-Tunnel from implementation and also the configuration perspective, right? So now we're going to shift uh, to talk about waypoint simplification a little bit, right? Um, so when we initially introduced uh, waypoint, uh, waypoint was only on a service account scoped. Um, so that's great, um, but um, what if you your tenant scope is really namespace, right? I know a lot of users, they are, you, you know, your desired tenant space is uh, namespace instead of service account. So uh, we made a lot of simplification to Waypoint also, so that not only we support uh, service account, but also support namespace uh, scope for Waypoint. So it depends on whichever you feel uh, comfortable as a tenant scope for layer seven processing, you can choose uh, to use uh, either waypoint uh, scoped uh, for service account or namespace. Uh, in order to deploy a waypoint proxy, it's uh, you can deploy it really simple. You use uh, the experimental command uh, to generate your Kubernetes gateway uh, resource, or you can just create the resource yourself. I would recommend you uh, use the command to have an example and then tweak, uh, tweak it as needed if, uh, if so. So for example, uh, in this example, it's super important to point out the gateway class name is, is your waypoint. So, uh, so that's to let the gateway um, controller for the waypoint controller to know to deploy a waypoint instead of a deploy a Istio uh, gateway, right? Um, and then the listener is 15008 because that's the port for uh, Edgebone. Um, so, so the example here is deploy a waypoint that's a namespace scope. And if you want to have a, a service account scoped uh, uh, waypoint, you just add a simple annotation to tell us what uh, the service account is for. Um, so one change we made is uh, Waypoint actually has its own service account now. So it's super important to let us know what service account uh, this is for. Uh, just to help you a little bit more understanding uh, Waypoint architecture. Uh, so this is a diagram from John and myself publish your blog on Waypoint. So uh, do check out that blog if you're interested to know a little bit more about Waypoint. So in a nutshell, when you uh, create uh, the gateway resource uh, to deploy your waypoints using kubectl apply command, um, SUD is going to serve as the waypoint controller and then um, sees the gateway resource uh, with the Istio waypoint as the gateway class name. And then it would automatically deploy the waypoint proxy for you based on uh, the gateway uh, resource. And then your waypoint, uh, it's going to be very similar as the sidecar, except that it's not running as a sidecar to your application pod, right? It's it's going to have its own uh, CA client. It's going to have its own XDS client. It's going to have needing XDS config from SDOD. So it's going to first establish a secure connection to SDOD um, and ask, hey, can I get my certificate signed, right? because the waypoint, as we mentioned, it's going to have its own uh, identity and um and SDOD is going to, you know, check the token and sign the uh, search for waypoint and then the waypoint can begin to uh, ask for XDS configuration from Israel control plane. Um, 
So that's uh, a nutshell of how uh, Waypoint um, works. Um, now, uh, I want to start you telling you guys the story, uh, how we decided to, why we started to looking at simplify the Waypoint, right? So we started looking at how can we simplify Waypoint configuration? Again, back to the story, there was maybe five person can understand Waypoint config when we initially launched uh, Waypoint because it was super hard uh, with, I think it was like two internal listeners, uh, super complex config. So we started looking into um, how we can simplify the waypoint config by should we apply export to annotation and sidecar resource like sidecar does, right? Because, you know, every single uh, waypoint, they're not going to need to reach out to every single other services and workloads in the cluster. So maybe we could look into these configuration from user to give us a hint. Um, so um, just to get you familiar with the sidecar configuration. So typically you apply um, export to configuration, right? As a result uh, from service producer, you're going to reduce uh, some of the configuration you see in this case, uh, you know, the purple sidecar and blue sidecar from namespace two. And then as a service consumer, you typically apply the sidecar resource, which specify, you know, what are the egress, um, you egress connections you can reach out to. Uh, in doing so, you effectively reduce uh, your configuration further, right? So if you apply that to namespace one and two, uh, you essentially what you are essentially seeing is a simplified configuration where you, within your namespace uh, waypoint, you can only see what's deployed in your namespace. For example, in this case, namespace one only sees the red and yellow. So um, we start to think about, you know, do we ask user to add these configurations, right? But the reality is most of the user actually don't like to add these configurations, right? And creating sidecar resources, that's a hassle for user to learn. So we decided, you know, what if we just introduce a destination only waypoint? From a waypoint perspective, it needs to only to know the endpoint, the paths, the workloads, it's managed by that particular waypoint, whether it's uh, name space or service account scope, right? So by introducing destination waypoint, we are really able to simplify the waypoint configuration to focus on only the relevant uh, paths and workloads that are relevant to the waypoint. And what's the benefit to, to bring to our user is we eliminate the need for sidecar and export to for waypoint, right? So you no longer need to worry about those configuration. I hope you like that. Uh, give us a thumbs up in the chat if you do like that Waypoint uh, simplification. So uh, we also did a little bit of uh, calculation of a simple example of using uh, sidecar resource was, uh, was, using, uh, was using Waypoint, right? The configuration we're coming down is uh, Waypoint has less than 1% of the configuration comparing with sidecar using the same 25 deployments with 10 parts in the example. So uh, that's how much configuration we were able to reduce uh, through this uh, destination only waypoint. Um, the other thing uh, about waypoint uh, I want to highlight is um, policy enforcement. For the longest time, Istio has server side, um, source side policy and also destination side policies. It's super confusing to our user and then they have to check out the logs on the source or on the destination side to figure out you know, what's going wrong and they have to check the configuration also. So with uh, destination only waypoint, we're having all the policy enforced on the destination, regardless whether it's route policy, or regardless whether it's uh, authorization policy. So it's so much easy for a user to understand, uh, read the logs and looking at the configuration just in one place. 
It's also super important in a mixed environment, uh, whether you are running uh, your client outside of the mesh or inside of the mesh, when the policy is always on the server side, so you are guaranteed to have the policy enforced, uh, which before when some of the policy are on the client side, you will be surprised, why are they not working? Um, so this is uh, the power of uh, the destination uh, only waypoints. Uh, egress waypoint, uh, it's under construction. So join us in the Ambient Dev channel and the Ambient Weekly meeting to learn a little bit more as we develop egress waypoint. Uh, last but not the least, I want to quickly go over some of the resource saving study we've done with small scale uh, with three deployments. We've no noticed 90% saving on layer four and 75% saving on layer four and layer seven. We also increased the scale to a little bit more to 150 plus and we're seeing consistent saving. So we do want to do more tests on thousands of plus and the even larger scale. Stay tuned for that. You might be wondering, what about sidecars? So sidecar will continue to be support. You can uh, interrupt between sidecar to pause in ambient. Um, so, so there are maybe certain scenario you will continue to use sidecar for now. So I do want to uh, show these scenarios to you. I think I'm running out of time. So I'm going to wrap up uh, just the key takeaway for my talk is the ambient is the new data plane introduced in Istio and Z-Tunnel and Waypoint. We have been drastically simplified both of them since the initial launch and uh, they are designed to scale with very minimal configuration. With that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing and I will be taking questions uh, if you have on the, note, on, the, on the chat box. So do let me know if you enjoy my session or if you have any questions, I will be there. Thank you all so much and uh, try the ambient and give us feedback.